so let's start our uh, second session. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning. It's Good a afternoon. great pleasure to be here, despite the fact that it's not a sunny day in New York. But that's okay. Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of OHR LLS and OZA, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this thematic session to under the team, building peaceful, just and inclusive societies. My name is Cristina Duarte and I'm the special advisor of the Secretary General on African Affairs. I will be moderating the discussion between our distinguished panelists and experts during this session. The purpose of this session two is to discuss the importance of the interlinkage between peace, security and development in Africa, LDCs and IT. Uh, I do believe that our discussion will, will pay particular attention to the critical role of inclusive institutional practices and equal access to public goods and services in preventing instabilities and sustaining peace in line, of course, with SDG 16. Allow me to bring very quickly to the table five issues. First, we all know that service delivery is not the only source of state legitimacy, but it is one of the main sources of perception of fairness or lack of by society in relation to the state. Second issue, exclusion from vital everyday services such as water, sanitation, education, health care, and housing magnifies socioeconomic disparities and amplifies the perceived openness of poverty and marginalization. Third issue, in Africa, where governments grapple with myriad of challenges, such as recourse and capacity constraints, rising urbanization, corruption, and in some instances, protracted conflict, exclusion from service delivery, has been shown to have a clear link to conflict as a driver, a trigger, or as a fertile grind, ground for instability. Fourth issue, the COVID-19 pandemic, whose socioeconomic impact was felt the most acutely by marginalized segments of society, has put additional pressure on government's capacity to deliver services to their citizens in a manner perceived equal, further eroding citizens' trust in institutions, citizens' trust in transparency and social cohesion. My last issue to our debate, the distribution of, of COVID-19 vaccines, a 2021 challenge. And the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines will test all the four issues that I mentioned before. And this issue will be, test, will be tested globally, regionally, nationally, and locally. So building peaceful, just, and inclusive society is critical if you wish to ensure that no one left behind. So to discuss these issues, I wish to introduce our distinguished panelists and experts. Allow me. Honorable Eisenhower Mukaka, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Malawi. Thank you for being with us today. Honorable Victoria Kibora, Minister of Justice, Human Rights, Human Rights and Civic, Civic Participation of Burkina Faso. Thank you, my dear sister. My dear colleague, Mrs. Auna Eziagonawa, Assistant Secretary General and Director of UNDP Regional Bureau for Africa. Thank you very much, my dear colleague, Auna. Dr. Cyril Obi, Program Director, 
the African Initiative, the Social Science Research Council. Thank you for being with us. And the last of our, our panelists, the younger one, Mr. Rafael Obonillo, young activist and the public policy expert. And be, besides these five panelists, actually six panelists, you have, we have with us a lead discussant, which is Honorable Marie Chardova, ambassador and permanent representative of the Czech Republic to the United Nations. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our distinguished panelists. Uh, please allow me to bear, to, um, to ask, to keep with your time, five minutes each one. So it is all my pleasure to call our first skipper, uh, our first speaker will be Honorable Eisenhower Mukaba, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Malawi. Allow me just to put you a question in my quality. I think the minister is just arriving. I'm correct? Anyone? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. Sorry for the day. It was completely back up. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure to see you. <laughs> so I was just about to give you the floor, Honorable Minister. And I was, as a moderator, I was about to, uh, to put you a question, if you allow me. I will proceed. In your country, has the government's lack of capacity to deliver public service to the population in an equal, just, uh, and efficient manner, being a driver of conflict or social unrest? So if so, what are the policy measures that the government of Malawi have implemented to promote inclusive institutions and equitable public service deliver? Honorable Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, the nexus between peace and development has been demonstrated in many contexts, and Malawi is therefore delighted that a session has been dedicated during this review meeting. And in discussing that nexus, we cannot ignore the issue of justice as well as inclus inclusiveness because the absence of any of these poses a risk to sustainable development. Malawi is mindful of the disproportionate progress made towards achieving the Istanbul Program of Action goal on peace, justice, and inclusiveness. We remain committed to its realization and hope that we fully embrace it in the next Program of Action as a tool social economic development. Our commitment to the promotion of peace, justice, and inclusiveness is pivotal in our obligations under various frameworks, such as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the African Union Union's Agenda 2063, but also my long-term development framework, the Malawi 2063. Our experience has taught us that a society that is at peace and where justice prevails can achieve sustainable prosperity. Malawi has taken practical steps to ensure domestic and international peace, consolidate good governance, and promote inclusiveness. For instance, we are implementing the Malawi National Peace Policy as one way of strengthening our governance institutions in order to promote the rule of law and ensuring access to justice whilst guaranteeing equality and non-discrimination. While upholding the strides that our content is making in terms of building peace, just, just and inclusive societies, we are also mindful that there are several raging conflicts on the continent. 
bemoan the economic disruption and development setbacks that such conflicts are bringing, and not only on the belligerent societies, but also on their neighborhoods and continent at large. We hope for an end to the conflicts and for peace to reign so that our continent can focus on development. As a peace-loving nation, Malaysia continues to contribute to, uh, to efforts to resolve such conflicts by supporting peace, uh, by supporting peacekeeping initiatives. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, a discussion on building peace or, or rather peaceful, just and inclusive societies is incomplete without the participation of LDCs in the institutions of global governance. Malawi reiterates the calls that have been made for reforms in the global governance architecture. The attainment of such reforms is precedent to a truly just and inclusive global community. Together, we shall achieve more. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for your insightful intervention. Je voudrais maintenant donner la parole à l'Honorable Ministre Vitoria Kibora. Excellence, est-ce que le manque de capacité du gouvernement à fournir des services publics à la population d'une manière équitable, juste et efficace, a-t-il été un facteur de conflit ou de troubles sociaux Dans l'affirmative, euh, quelles sont les mesures stratégiques qui ont été mises en œuvre pour promouvoir des institutions inclusives et une prestation équitable des services publics Vous avez la, euh, la parole, Madame la Ministre. Madame la ministre, le, le, vous, on n'écoute on écoute pas, on n'écoute pas. Ah. Maintenant, c'est parfait. Maintenant, c'est parfait. C'est bon? D'accord. Parfait, madame la ministre. OK, ça va maintenant. Oui, oui. Bien. Donc, je reprends. Je disais que le gouvernement burkinabé, en dépit des ressources limitées dont il dispose, tant, tant bien que mal à foutre fournir à sa population des services sociaux de base, santé, éducation et travail de qualité en prenant en compte les principes d'égalité et d'équité entre les citoyens et ceux conformément à la loi fondamentale du pays qui prévoit en son article premier que tout Burkinabé naisse libre et égaux en droit. Donc, tous ont une égale vocation à jouir de tous les droits et de toutes les libertés garanties par la présente Constitution. Les discriminations de toutes sortes, notamment celles fondées sur la race, l'ethnie, la religion, la couleur, le sexe, la langue, la religion, les castes, les opinions politiques et les fortunes et naissances sont prohibées par donc, cette euh, disposition constitutionnelle. Le pays a certes connu des conflits et troubles sociaux qui ont été causés par d'autres facteurs. Ce sont des conflits intercommunautaires, des revendications sociales des travailleurs, etc. Mais à ce jour, le Burkina Faso n'a pas encore enregistré de conflits de troubles sociaux qui trouvent son origine dans le manque de capacité du gouvernement à fournir des services publics à la population d'une manière équitable. Donc, c'est ce que j'ai à dire pour cette question. Merci, madame. Merci, merci beaucoup, madame la ministre, pour partager l'expérience euh, avec nous. Et uh, now, I move on, and I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Haruna is Iquarona, UN Assistant Secretary General and Director of UNDP Regional Bureau for Africa. Allow me, my dear colleague Huna, are you there? I would like uh, to... Yes, Where? yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hi, how are you, Huna? Good, good to see you, Christina. 
Me too. It's a pleasure, my dear colleague. Uh, the question, if you allow me, Auna, how can the UN and other development partners provide adequate and more effective support to LDCs for institutional building as a mechanism for, con for conflict prevention and peace building? What are the best practices from African countries and the LDCs in particular, to build adequate and inclusive institutions that are inducive to public service delivery, as well as conflict prevention. My dear colleague, back to you. Thank you so much, our distinguished moderator, our dear sister, Christina, and uh, warm wishes from New York to all the um, distinguished panelists here with me, um, honorable ministers, uh, brothers and sisters, this is a, an incredibly important um, topic. Peace, justice, and inclusiveness constitute the enabling conditions for the achievement of each of the five specific objectives set by the, in, by the Istanbul uh, Declaration uh, for the period 2020, 2011 to 2020. And this is why uh, the declaration identified good governance at all levels as one of the eight interlinked priority areas. You see that trends in non-traditional conflict are such as violent pro protests, election related violence and terrorism related deaths are actually rising. And the 2020 Global Peace Index indicates that cases of civil unrest um, in Sub-Saharan Africa rose dramatically from 32 in 2011 to 292 in 2018. And these protests reflect the increase in inequality and the frayed trust between state and, and the people and society. They are also reflective of the impact of digital technologies, uh, which have come into the landscape with a different mode of organizing. So we must work to build adequate and inclusive institutions, as the minister from Malawi was saying, that are conducive for public service delivery, as well as for conflict prevention. And some of the good practices that we are starting to note uh, in, in the areas where we work include the following. The first is that we must work with pinnacle institutions like the African Union and sub-regional uh, institutions to set the right continental frameworks on institutional building for public service delivery, not only to develop policies and strategies, but also to put capacities in place to actually implement on the ground. And UNDP, along with other agencies, has been working in close partnership with the African Union, the regional economic communities, and also sub-regional institutions to national governments as well. Civil society organizations must be pulled in, women and youth groups, in order to strengthen their capacity to address these emerging challenges. And some of them are actually quite complex. And to continue to build the, that peaceful uh, uh, environment for development. This is the case with the partnerships that we have with the Lake Chad Basin Commission. This is actually one of the examples I want to give, uh, the, where we worked with the African Union and uh, the, the LCBC to uh, establish a regional stabilization program. Now working in those four Lake Chad countries to help rebuild people's lives, uh, to, to rebuild trust between communities and their governments, but also rebuild livelihoods. And we are doing the same now with the G5 Sahel and in that corridor of the Liptaka Guma uh, area with the authority there also to open up a stabilization uh, program uh, with uh, donors uh, making huge investments for us to reach communities directly and actually give them those peace dividends that allow them to see hope and therefore a reason for them themselves to contribute to, to peace. And, and second point, uh, Christina, has to do with working in the UN as one. I think this is important that if we're going to have an influence in this area, we must band together as a UN system and produce greater impact in the, in the work that we're doing. An example of this is our integrated strategy for the Sahel, 
uh, the UN Integrated Strategy for the Sahel, which brings together 18 UN agencies, 18 UN interagency projects, looking at how we can stabilize, sustain, transform, and create a, a, a groundswell of socioeconomic transformation uh, and security, actually, for the uh, populations who live in this very troubled uh, zone. Um, examples also in Cabo, Cabo, Cabo Delgado in Mozambique, where we're working with WFP, IOM, and others uh, using the Peace Building Fund. By the way, I want to recognize here the Peace Building Fund, fund as a financial financing instrument that is really useful to, to promote what we're talking about here today. And this is uh, paying off in, in cross-border work that we do with several, um, with several of our uh, UN uh, sister agencies. Let me stop here. Um, there are other examples I can come in in the Q&A, but I think I used up my five minutes already. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Auna, for putting the dots in the eyes. Thank you very much. Now, I would like, let's move on. And I would like uh, to give the floor to Dr. Siri Lobi, as I announced at the beginning, is the program director of the Africa Initiative, so uh, the Social Science Research Council. Dr. Obi, I have a question for you. What is the research evidence or now inclusive institutional practice and equitable public service deliver can play a role in preventing conflicts and instabilities in the Africa region, especially in fragile and least developed settings. What are the best practices for LDCs in addressing the peace and security, in addressing institutional building and sustainable development nexus? Dr. Obi, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Your Excellencies. Um, thank you for the question. I would uh, attempt to answer the question. It's quite broad, but um, I think it's, uh, it's very good. I think the first thing we need to do is to acknowledge what we have, that both uh, the, uh, the African Union and the regional economic communities do have a lot of what I call normative frameworks for ensuring that we build peaceful and inclusive and just societies. Uh, that is already been done. Um, and what we are doing now is to begin to research how COVID-19 is beginning to upset the apple cart, so to speak. Uh, there are emerging challenges because the pandemic has upturned a lot of things, has uh, created challenges, but at the same time has created opportunities. What the research is showing so far is that Particularly, I'm going to focus more on the COVID pandemic because the speakers before me have actually spoken a lot about other issues. And the first thing we have noticed is that um, I would say the rising incidence of violence against women is one of the things that is emerging in the research across the various countries. That the effect of some of the preventive measures like lockdowns is increasing violence against women. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also creating challenges for food security across uh, LDCs. Uh, this is something that the, the research is showing. It's also showing that a lot of resources that would have gone into uh, delivery of services as well as um, uh, peace, peace operations are also somehow going into trying to, um, sorry, some of the resources that could have gone into addressing basic services and functions have also been diverted into trying to battle COVID-19. And those sectors are beginning to feel the impact of this, this, this resources. Another thing I want to talk about very quickly is that the research is also showing the impact on education, that lockdowns have affected education in terms of enrollments, in terms of uh, challenges that are posed by people not being able to access classes online. Uh, these are general issues that LDCs are struggling with. Another thing related to that is also the question of the situation with IDPs and refugees 
who are also being affected by some of the challenges posed by COVID. I would say that in terms of best practices, I think the speaker before me has actually spoken eloquent, eloquently to some of this. We are seeing situations in which some governments are actually taking steps like providing uh, safety nets, like providing palliatives, like providing relief, working with local and international organizations to make sure that some of these things are... Some of these things. I'm sorry, I'm... I'm hearing some echo. Is it okay? Can I go continue? Yes, please. Yes, please. I would, um, like, I would like to, uh, to ask the panelists and attendees to, to move their micros, please. Uh, Dr. Cyril, you have the floor again. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, and I would say that um, what we actually need, and I'm going to move quickly to recommendations because I see that my time is fast running out. I think what we really need is better coordination between these frameworks that already exist, both in terms of the African Union and the RECS, whether you are looking at AU's uh, Agenda 2063 and the SDG's uh, Agenda 2030 and silencing the guns uh, 2030, which are all very good frameworks, is to be able to coordinate this upwards to the UN and coordinate this downwards from the regional to the national and local levels. Okay. I think this is something that really has to be the attention has to be paid to. The big elephant in the room for me is resources. Equality in terms of access to resources. So I think we all need to work to make sure that the most vulnerable groups in society uh, have access and we build institutions that can guarantee this. The institutions are there, but I think that strengthening these institutions and developing the political will to make them work is also something. Technology. This is a time to move technologies, both in terms of not just equality of access to vaccines, but the technology of producing vaccines in Africa is also very critical. It will address a lot of our issues. Issues of employment is also uh, something that uh, address that needs to be addressed. And finally, not to belittle the point, two issues are important. How African people and African governments, both in LDCs, and across and, and countries uh, and institutions that work with them can help to renew and renegotiate the social contract to mainstream issues around greater inclusiveness for people-centered development. I think that is Dr. Very OB, time please. <laughs> um, and finally, the issue of finance, budgeting and programming. We need a coordinated and integrated approach by all the various stakeholders at different levels. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Obi. Um, it, it's, it, it's quite clear how research is on top of the nexus, on the nexus issues. Now, I would like to give the floor uh, to Mr. Rafael Obonoyo, is a young activist and a public policy specialist, as I mentioned at the beginning of our session. Uh, Mr. Raphael, I have a, a question for you. If there is a social group with a profound feeling of being marginalized is the youth population. So much human energy not captured to feed development, but wasted to feed in instability. What have we been missing, all of us, policymakers, multilateral institutions, partners? What have we been missed so that a young person choose a pen and not a gun? What should we do so that that young person choose a pen and not a gun? Mr. Raphael, back to you. Uh, thank you so very much. Quite, uh, it's quite a pleasure to be part of this uh, conversation and, uh, of course, uh, giving the perspective of young people uh, on the continent and uh, in LDCs. Uh, just some quick statistics. One is that uh, 600 million young people globally live in fragile and conflict-affected uh, areas, and a large population of uh, proportion of that is actually youth in Africa. And uh, also 15 of the 19 uh, countries where there is uh, active armed conflict are actually in uh, LDCs and uh, in, um, in Africa. That is one. Two, 
is that uh, Africa has a rising population of, um, of young people, the fastest growing in the world. Uh, this intersects with a number of uh, threats to peace and, uh, and, and, and security, especially where we are talking about exclusion, where we are talking about uh, issues of lack of education, lack of uh, 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 unemployment, where we are talking about limited access to public service, uh, including access to, to justice. In some cases, absence of uh, such services uh, also have direct impact on um, social cohesion and, uh, and uh, instability. The other point I want to, to raise is uh, the issue of political instability, that things like uh, uh, youth unemployment pose a threat to social, pros uh, pr I mean, economic prosperity, social cohesion, and uh, uh, political stability. And violence and, armed conf and conflict also have uh, uh, direct acute affect, uh, I mean, um, uh, impact on, uh, on, uh, on youth. Also is that uh, young people face many obstacles in their transition from childhood to adulthood. And in many parts of the world, access to education, issues of unemployment and scourge of HIV and AIDS, and even most recently COVID-19 exhibit these, uh, these difficulties. If you look at COVID-19 uh, in Africa, for example, a majority of young people are in the informal sector. 80% of uh, the working youth population on the continent are actually in the informal sector, which was really hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so that means that uh, young people are facing acute challenges. What needs to be done uh, quickly? I think one is uh, we must see youth not just as a negative force, but we must see youth uh, in terms of uh, their energy, their talent, their skills, their enthusiasm, so that we harness the positive contribution of young people uh, in, uh, in the society. You should see youth as the greatest asset in our countries, on our continent, and in our uh, LDCs. A, a second is that uh, we must have people-centered policies. And uh, by this, I mean, uh, we must also make sure that we do not leave youth behind when we are developing these uh, policies. A third is developing programs that uh, uh, address youth needs and, uh, and concerns in, uh, in LDCs. It's very, very uh, important. Uh, fourth is the issue of building partnerships. We must ensure that everyone is brought on board, private sector, international community, development partners need to be on board. And last but not least is the question of building inclusive economies. We must ensure that economic benefits are enjoyed by the larger population. It's not just a few people who are enjoying uh, inclusive, I mean, I mean uh, the benefits of economies. And lastly, is building strong and uh, inclusive institutions and making sure that youth are involved in governance, youth are involved in decision making, and that youth are not left out when it comes to issues of um, political processes and even peace and security uh, processes in, at the local, national, but even global level. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Mr. Raphael, for such, such clear intervention. And now I would like to give the floor to our lead discussant, Honorable Ambassador Marie Chatardova. Uh, you have the floor, please. Um, in terms of providing the perspective of partner countries uh, to our discussion, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Under Secretary General, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to intervene in this session after such prominent speakers. Uh, the Czech Republic has always been a great supporter of the SDG 16 implementation. Let me remind that the primary focus of our ECOSOC presidency in 2018 was the development of initiatives promoting sustainable, resilient and inclusive societies through participation of all. Uh, we really believe that building sustainable and inclusive societies is a cross-cutting endeavor which is essential to the achievement of all SDGs. Many LDCs have made progress over the last decade in achieving good governance, the rule of law, the protection and promotion of human rights and the democratic participation, despite many challenges to face, including severe impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic that hit LDCs disproportionately. 
Sustainable development is closely linked to peace, justice, and strong institutions. And there is no peace without development. There is no development without peace, and there is no peace and development without human rights. Uh, now I will follow the topic of the previous speaker uh, because I, I think that it is an extremely important point. Africa is a young continent. Young people as agents of change could become an important social and economic boost to the whole region. On the other hand, it could further increase the risk of instability if young people are deprived of equality and affordable education, stable and decent employment, and of being heard as a strong political voice. Access to quality and affordable education and lifelong learning opportunities, including better civic education programs, is key for the young people so that they can better prepare to exercise their socioeconomic and political rights. Also, education, educating women and girls is especially crucial so that they can contribute to their communities and boost their countries' economies through their work and knowledge. The Czech Republic's development cooperation focuses on a limited number of partner countries and priority themes. We strive for effective result-oriented action and a clear contribution to partner countries, including strengthening local ownership of development policies, notably by aligning its objectives with the respective national development strategies of the partner countries uh, and by promoting their inclusive participation in decision making. We implement uh, development projects in Africa to promote comprehensive progress in rural uh, areas. Uh, as an example of good practice, let me mention the project of the Czech Development Agency carried out in cooperation with the NGO People in Need in Ethiopia. This project aimed to establish a functioning system on inclusive education and to contribute to increased social and economic inclusion of all, irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion, or economic or other status. And now uh, allow, allow me to ask the honorable panelists uh, whether they can elaborate more on the role of young people as key drivers of sustainable development uh, and on the initiatives that can contribute to the empowerment of young people. And if I may, also to the empowerment of women. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my final question, uh, what kind of support uh, you expect from your development partners that should be considered when shaping the new program of action? I will stop here and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Ambassador uh, Marie. Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to open the floor for an interactive discussion. So in order to accommodate as many speakers as possible, I kindly request to you uh, to you present yourself and limit your interventions to three minutes. So to request the floor, please indicate your name and institution in the chat. So by also raising your hands. The floor is open. Do I have any ends? Uh, yes, so I have the pleasure to give the floor um, Dr. From Howard would like to intervene. Ah, yeah. Doctor, sorry, I need to open a little bit my window, so you give me just a second. Sure. Doctor, Doctor Alsanatu, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much 
uh, for these very insightful uh, remarks. I have a suggestion perhaps, and then a question if you don't mind. Um, first of all, my suggestion would be perhaps to have uh, the panelists uh, to thank them again for these very insightful uh, remarks to perhaps elaborate a little bit on some aspect of their of, uh, of the presentation. Overall speaking, when I'm referring to the United Nations and World Bank latest uh, report on inclusive pe uh, peace, the pathway, I realized that in the major, uh, basically, um, facet, the emphasis is put on, um, on regional uh, and international cooperation. So my question for the floor basically is to, is to know exactly how, whether we speak of, of the representative of nation state here or the United Nations system, how do they really approach this question? I'm hailing for Sahel, uh, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, um, the, the question of the scarcity of resources, the interdependency between the scarcity of resources, uh, the, the conflict, uh, we, we, are, we are living now in the process and, and under very pressure and pressing issues of a climate change. So my second question would be uh, actually uh, drawn for two of the panelists, but others might be feel free to answer. Uh, Madame la Ministre du Burkina Faso, uh, uh, de manière absolument uh, formidable, uh, bien expliqué en fait uh, de son côté l'intervention uh, uh, succincte et flexible qu'elle ont notamment pour ce qui est de la gestion des communautés uh, des communautés uh, inter uh, interétatiques et je pense qu'elle faisait notamment référence uh, entre autres aux communautés uh, pastorales et, et agricoles donc j'aimerais uh, de ce côté là s'il vous plaît avoir uh, avoir une uh, une élaboration pour euh, la stratégie qui peut être mise au niveau intra-étatique, sachant que la quasi-majorité des États, euh, euh, des LCD, comme on dit, c'est-à-dire les pays les moins avancés, se retrouvent dans le Sahel. Comment est-ce qu'on compte à l'avenir apporter euh, une solution de paix préventive dans, dans, dans cet aspect-là And uh, my second question would be uh, for the director of the United, the UNDP in, uh, in Africa. Uh, she uh, rightly mentioned that uh, I liked very much what she said when she said that we, and I'm quoting her, work as one, and um, she elaborates on 18 UN interagency project working right now. Um, Madame la directrice, would you be kind enough um, to let us know which would be your priority in terms of uh, uh, combining an interdependency action regarding both um, the climate change, the scarcity of resources, and also the population in the Sahel. Thank you very much for your attention. Je vous remercie beaucoup. Thank you, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. I would like to ask again the uh, for the to keep with the time, please help me manage this session. So now I have the pleasure to to give the floor to Mr. Eduard Muba, please. Eduard. So uh, he he just cancelled. Now I have the pleasure to give the floor to. Sorry, to uh, Professor Alain Tuskdan, please. You are muted. Bonjour, madame. Ah, yes. Non, ça, ça Bonjour, ça madame. Merci beaucoup. Ça marche, ça marche. Okay, fantastic. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, uh, Madam Under Secretary General and honorable speakers. Uh, just very briefly to share with you some very encouraging. A news from the research spectrum conducted on behalf of OSA um, that speaks to our uh, excellency from the Czech uh, Republic's concern 
uh, we found that actually when we asked participants in a recent survey on the interlinkages to list the top five uh, opportunities to reach the SDGs, youth fall in one of the five top areas of opportunity, along with in first place, good governance, which has been spoken about eloquently by all of our speakers, promoting development, uh, building peace and ending conflict, as well as growing the economy. So I thought that it might be quite helpful um, to share that with you with respect to the opportunities to reach not only the SDGs, but also our aspirations for the Africa we want. And then finally, just to say, when we asked about the biggest obstacles to achieving Vision 63, as well as the uh, Agenda, 20, uh, Agenda 63, as well as the uh, 2030 goals, it was conflict that was cited, as you've rightly pointed out, in terms of being one of the biggest obstacles. However, when we asked our participants from the majority of African member states where they felt our priority needed to lie, they responded that it should be on growing political will. So again, bringing in this nexus, as you have rightly pointed out, between, um, between governance, development, uh, and peace in relation to human rights. So thank you very much for enabling me to make that contribution. And thank you once again to all of you for your enlightening presentations. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Anna, for such a great comment. Now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Edouard Mouba, please. Sorry, we're trying to unmute him. It's not working, Erica? Not working, we can move on. And yes, I will on. move on. And uh, now I have the pleasure to give the floor to uh, Tombuelo Pedro. Please, you have the floor. Yes, Pedro? Again, we're struggling with unmuting. If colleagues are called upon, if you could please manually unmute yourself so you can intervene, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pedro, uh, you can unmute yourself because the, from the central controller, they are not uh, accessing to your micro, please. Okay, let's move on, if you allow me. I need to manage the time. So um, I have a couple of questions. I would say very interesting questions to Madame La Ministre Vittoria and to my dear colleague Huna, the ladies in the panel. Madame La Ministre? Madame La Ministre, vous avez, de, de, vous avez la parole. I think you have a micro problem. Est-ce que vous m'écoutez, Madame la Ministre? Madame la Ministre, Victoria? Oui, je suis là, mais je n'ai pas entendu les questions et donc je ne sais pas sur quoi il faut que je dise, même. Um, uh, the professor from Howard University? She was quite interested in, uh, in, the, um, in the experience, your experience, so in Burkina Faso experience, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, particip participatory experience, as well as in, in terms of building inclusive institutions to address a situation that has been increasing from an instability standpoint. Basically, if you could address from an experience standpoint uh, the, the, the issues that you are discussing in this, in this session. Madame la Ministre. Yeah. 
Vous avez posé la question. Oui, je, je, je suis en train de résumer la question posée par, euh, par le, la professeure de okay. Howard University. On a une énorme difficulté parce qu'on euh, n'entend pas, il y a des passages à vide, donc on ne sait pas ce qui s'est dit. Et ça, ah, vous avez des, des problèmes de connexion. Alors, euh, euh, permettez-moi, Madame la Ministre, euh, je, oh, peut-être on, on, je vais passer la parole à ma collègue Aouna. Oui. Aouna, you have the floor. Are you with me, Aouna? There are a, a question that yes. is addressed to you, Aouna? Yes, sure, uh, Christina. Um, my, uh, Dr. Mamadou, thank you for the question. You know, the way we see the problem in the Sahel and many other places that we work, um, because your problem was what is the priority, climate change, mm, resource scarcity, and, and, you know, working with the population. It, it's a puzzle, not a, not a single mm -hmm. problem. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a puzzle that we have to solve. And the approach here is to allow for better contextualization of all the different concerns and have an integrated approach. That's why the, uh, the Sahel strategy is very Somebody has not muted here. I would much appreciate if you could mute your micro, please, if you are Thank not you. Uh, thank you. So for us, we're looking at it from this lens of a puzzle that needs to be solved through an integrated approach. So it's not a single problem of, you know, energy or climate change, but all of these things are interlinked. When we work on natural resource governance, we affect the environment for enabling youth empowerment and youth employment as our youngest member of the panel was saying you have to create conditions for young people to um, have decent jobs but also for them to express their talents because we are finding a lot of youth on our continent have actually more talent that we give them credit for and they have that opportunity to contribute Uh, to transformation in their own communities if we create that enabling environment. So our legal environment, that's why institutions matter. African countries have a lot of natural resources, but very often these resources are not working to improve the lives of the people. So natural resource governance as a governance piece is something that we, we must look at as we have to look at structural economic transformation, how we add value to the commodities that Africa has, instead of just exporting raw commodities. When we create opportunities for local production and value addition and regional value chains, we create jobs for our millions of youth. The same with sustainable energy, particularly when we look at renewable energy. If you look at the Sahel, for instance, you know, the, the, the greatest assets and resources for renewable energy in the world live, dwell in this, in this region. How do we start to invest to bring that uh, out as something that contributes to addressing climate change, but at the same time creates the foundations for sustainable development. And then of course, mm -hmm. peace and security, what we are talking about here today, which has mm -hmm. largely to do with the, that zone of inequality where the wealth has to be shared equally, where we have to make sure that our systems are more inclusive than they currently are. So it's not one problem, one single problem that is a priority. It's approaching this in an integrated manner because one uh, investment touches on the other. Uh, uh, positively or negatively. Thank you, you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Auna, for such a look and comments. Uh, and allow me to build a little bit. Maybe, and I would like to, to put a question to the panelists also. Uh, I think uh, COVID-19 is giving us a huge opportunity to understand that governance 
in LDCs plus IT needs to go beyond political legitimacy. We need to be aware that we need to build social legitimacy to consolidate political legitimacy. And this address, of course, another issue that has been raised by my colleague, Aruna. The question of ownership, ownership, the exercise of ownership of, over economic, social, and financial and financial flows. Uh, now, with your permission, I will try again, Mr. Eduard Muba. Uh, is, now, uh, is now available? Can he connect it? Edward, please. Hello? Yes. Well, I, sir, I joined, I joined the conversation uh, a bit very late because I've been having some technical problems and I may not be able to start exactly where or cover the grounds that the presentations of the panelists have made. But I want to appreciate the fact that uh, if I'm asking a question that maybe may never fit. I want you to ask to consider my ignorance. But having said, I just wanted to ask a question that given the challenges that uh, we faced as a continent, as exacerbated by COVID-19, uh, issues around climate change, issues around inequalities, violence against women and children, and you also have weak systems and processes. Is it possible for the continent in the wake of all of these challenges to be able to achieve the kind of peacefulness, the kinds of, of, of cohesiveness mm -hmm. that we are opting for? Thank you, very good question. Uh, and I think that question is, is a very good question for Dr. Obi, but later on, Dr. Obi, later on. Uh, now I have the pleasure, let's try again, if we manage to give the floor to Mr. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Pedro, he, he still he, he stills available to, to, to put his question. They were able to unmute just as you were changing your um, order the last time. So let's give them 30 seconds more and then, or less. Tombuelo, Pedro. Tombuelo, Mr. Tombuelo. I'll come back, no problem, Erica. I, 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 I didn't want to miss such a good question to place with Dr. Obi. He's ready to respond. Dr. Obi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for, for the question. I, I think that is a very important question. Yeah. But my attitude is that the LDCs and African countries yeah. have to be optimistic. The most important thing about Africa, two very key things are that Africa is rich in resources and Africa is rich in people and richer still because most of the people are young people, full of energy, full of ideas and with visions. And therefore, what needs to be done is to find a cohesive and coordinated and integrated manner of harnessing all this great potential and making that difference. And in my initial remarks, I spoke about a new social contract. And this must be based on trust. A lot of what we need to do has to do with leadership and trust building. And we have to do our homework at the local and national levels. And as I said, there's so much there in terms of regional, continental and global frameworks that provide enough space. How do we develop that political will to create those conditions that would facilitate inclusiveness, non-discrimination, and open up the door to groups that are vulnerable, either as minorities or groups with disabilities. And something that has not come up so far is the role of civil society. 
I think we need to discuss the role of civil society writ large, that civil society has a critical role in raising levels of consciousness, in doing the groundwork and drawing the attention of both the people and governments, setting the agenda for how we respond to the challenge of inclusiveness during a period of COVID. I want to talk only about one thing because I know I don't have much time. It's the whole question of how do we socially engage with the issue of having equal access to health, what I call health security. How do we have inclusive health security? How do we guarantee that people have access to affordable and quality public health? Not just because of COVID-19, but because of other killer diseases. You understand what is happening in Guinea with the return of Ebola. You understand what is happening with HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, issues around malaria and waterborne diseases. I think the LDCs have to come up with a regional and a global position on how to address one of these issues because a healthy people will be able to achieve a lot and renegotiating the social contract to build trust and to give people a sense of belonging and citizenship of equal ownership with their government would release a lot of energies. And I think energies, social energy is so important to building uh, inclusive and just societies so that all the hindrances that tie our people down would, would be taken off systematically, but this will have to be in, in conversation with the people. How do we talk to the people? How do we engage the people meaningfully? And how do LDCs project this new African voice and energy to the global stage and make the world have a strong and solid commitment towards uh, providing the resources, providing the enabling environment and supporting the initiatives from the ground upwards to ensure that we have peaceful and inclusive and just African societies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robi. You raise a very important question, leadership and trust building. I think you, ju you just gave me the opportunity to ask Honorable Minister from Malawi. Honorable Minister of Malawi. Honorable Minister of Malawi. Um, uh, we just heard Dr. Robi raising two important questions from a governance standpoint, leadership and trust building. These two issues you mentioned in a very clear way in your original remarks. Would like to build on a little bit more on those two issues and the experience of Malawi, please. Uh, thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, I think uh, uh, the speaker before me raised very important questions or topics. And uh, you are talking about governance, you are talking about acceptance. Uh, I, I think what has happened in Malawi could be an important uh, case study. Exactly. You see, Leaders occupy positions of leadership because the general population trusts them. And uh, they are continuing in that position of leadership depends heavily on sustained trust of the people. And if people do not trust their leadership, what the results is uh, uprising, you know, chaos and, uh, and all that. Now, leadership is key in ensuring that uh, there is peace, ensuring that uh, there is justice, and uh, uh, eventually ensuring that there is development. Now, if there is no balance or clear balance between leadership and trust of the people, then what results 
is a negative effect on development. So yes, I would like to agree that uh, leadership is key, but at the same time, uh, trust of the people is very key uh, in order for leadership uh, to be sustained in the position uh, of, of, of trust. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Minister, for giving us a very clear position from uh, uh, African, African leadership. Um, we have, a, 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 let's say, a written question from Dr. Mamadou, again, the researcher, a researcher from Howard University. The question is as follows. How do you approach the question of sc scarcity of resources, independence between scarcity, climate change, and conflict? Uh, and I would like to, to, to give the floor to my dear colleague, Ahuna, to address uh, this question. Ahuna, please, do you have the floor? Uh, yes, Christina. I think in my earlier intervention, I did um, address Dr. Mamadou's uh, question, but I did have a comment on the last uh, question that uh, my brother Cyril Obi uh, uh, touched on. I first would like to align myself his, with his um, response there. I think it's important that we look at Africa from a promise rather than a problem lens. If we continue, I think what we've done in the last five decades, which was always look at Africa as a question mark rather than a place that uh, produces solutions. And really this has been proved wrong by what we've seen even during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, how Africa responded and how African people uh, stepped up to the plate and, and uh, started to innovate. And we have been very interested in looking at the innovations coming out of Africa in response to COVID-19 and why this continent is not in the ground, as many predicted, um, because of COVID-19. And I think that that's the strength we need to build on. That's the promise we need to hold on to. And two things underpin that. One is the Africa continental free trade area. Um, sorry, I much, sorry, I would much appreciate it if you can mute your micros. My apologies, Auna, you have the floor again. Yes, I, I was just going to say in terms of where is the promise, where does it lie? It lies in three areas in my view. One is the Africa continental free trade area, which is an opportunity for Africa for the first time to trade with itself in a in a constructive way. And the member states have totally invested in that. So when uh, Mr. Obi says we have the frameworks, we have the will. Yes, that is one of them. And we have to now really mobilize behind this initiative to ensure that it works. But not just works for the rich, but works for the young people, for the women who, are, who have been trading all their lives in the cross-border locations for, you know, uh, the, the people who are marginalized in, 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 those, in those contexts. So that's one promise that we have to hang on to. The second one is Africa's youthful population at 70% of the population, dynamic, young, and yes, for the most part, healthy. And we need to invest more in the health of that group so that they, you know, the, the um, economies of Africa can rest on that energy and enthusiasm and talent of youth. And the third one is on new technologies. Africa is the only continent at a point where it can fully leverage new technologies and digital solutions for development. It's not that we, uh, we abandon industrialization as a whole, but we look at the fourth industrial revolution as an opportunity for Africa. Thank you, thank you. Uh, very much, Auna. Very strong comments. Let's look Africa from a promised lens, not a problem lens. This is clearly clear, a strong call to reset our mindsets. Thank you. Now I would like to give again an opportunity for Mr. Predu, Pedro Tomboelli to take the floor. I hope that now will be possible because this is my fourth attempt. Mr. Predu, are you there? Oui, est-ce que vous m'écoutez là? Oui, oui, bien sûr. Vous m'entendez et je peux parler en français alors. Hein? Vous pouvez parler en français, anglais ou portugais? Ou en portugais. Oui, oui. 
Oui, euh, je, je viens suivi euh, euh, toutes les discussions et les présentations de, de, de nos panélistes et le thème euh, comme tel bâtir, euh, bâtir des sociétés pacifiques, justes et inclusives euh, et, et, est un thème récurrent. Et d'actualité, c'est vrai, parce que le besoin s'est fait toujours sentir. On a toujours deux conflits euh, par-ci, par-là. Alors, moi, j'étais intéressé à l'intervention de, de, de la représentante de, de PNUD quand il parlait de l'expérience qui a réussi au niveau de Sahel avec euh, le euh, UN System Integrated Strategy for Sahel. Alors, moi, j'aimerais savoir s'il n'y euh, a pas euh, en vue par exemple, euh, l'élaboration d'autres stratégies, par exemple, nous, nous prenons les, 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 les conflits au niveau de, de, de pays du Grand Lac. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas, de, ils attendent qu'il n'y ait, euh, y a, y a, y a, y a pas de stratégie de, pour prévenir tout ce qui peut arriver Je crois que j'étais intéressé pour ça et aussi de, de, de savoir si euh, le, le, le cadre au niveau de, du, du continent et, et, de, et au niveau du draft, oh, alors c'est seulement une idée que le PNUD A. Merci, merci, Pedro. Um, I will give the floor again to Aouna to respond this, to this question that was a quite direct question to, to her. Mais j'aimerais bien prendre l'opportunité si on discute le, si on discute le Sahel Zone, euh, j'aimerais bien donner l'opportunité après à Madame la Ministre. Aouna, please, you have the floor to, to address these questions. Thank you, Christine, and thanks to the colleague who uh, posed the question. If I understand, it's um, related to the, to the um, UNIS uh, integrated strategy of the UN in the Sahel and how we are... Um, how we are working uh, within within that group is that is that the exactly the exactly the but in the right direction yes yeah. yes no i mean you know one of the reasons why the strategy was put together was because we had so many different strategies in the sahel by different agencies and actors And the Secretary General obviously was very concerned with this uh, fragmentation of our presence in the Sahel, which was not benefiting anyone. So a few years ago, the decision was indeed made that the UN must work as one in the Sahel. And the, the first step to that was to integrate our strategy. So we have one strategy, one program, one plan, and, and working towards one budget as well. And this would be something that would help us engage directly with the actors and the population in the region as one. And that strategy has articulated now into six areas, uh, six pillars of support and, and three programmatic portfolios, looking at governance, looking at resilience and looking at energy. And, and we have now a special coordinator appointed by the Secretary General who will further uh, help in the in the mobilization advocacy and resource um, resourcing of the strategy so that it doesn't stop with the strategy we have actually a support plan that is linked to the strategy and the idea indeed is to take it to the countries and to the region uh, the cross-border work as well um, so the presence of the of the um, special coordinator for the Sahel, Uh, is supposed to help us enhance the practical articulation of this uh, strategy on the ground in the various uh, countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aouna. Um, avant de passer le, la parole à Madame la Ministre, je pense que j'ai aussi une autre question uh, pour vous, Madame la Ministre. Peut-être vous pouvez adresser. C'est une question posée par le conseiller auprès de la mission permanente de Madagascar auprès des Nations Unies. Comment créer un travail décent sans passer par la simple création d'emplois De quoi à vivre seulement Le travail décent requiert plusieurs paramètres. 
selon les droits fondamentaux. Est-ce possible pour l'Afrique, notamment les pays moins avancés Je pense que c'est une question qui, euh, qui c'est directement lié à vos responsabilités dans le gouvernement, Madame la Ministre, et j'ai le plaisir de vous donner la parole. Madame la Ministre Je pense qu'on continue avec des problèmes de contrôle. Oui. Oui. Est-ce que vous avez écouté la question? Oui. Oui, Madame Christine. Vous avez écouté la question? Non. Je pense que du côté de Burkina, on a des, des, des problèmes. Euh, euh, Uh, let's move on. So now I have the opportunity to give the floor again to Dr. Usunatu. Please, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Moderatrice. Uh, Madame uh, the Director General for UNDP uh, Africa, I thank you very much for your answer. And uh, honestly speaking, I'm uh, kind of excited and I'm looking forward to see the comprehensive framework that will come uh, out of the 18 agencies. You mentioned interagency project. So this is something I'm looking forward to it. And thank you for your answer. Now, my second answer, if you don't mind, was actually more related to the nation level state because um, the minister of Burkina Faso mentioned something about um, la gestion en réalité, une bonne gestion Uh, communautaire, des conflits communautaires. Et ça reste en réalité, nous le savons tous au Sahel, un problème d'une grande importance. Donc, en fait, je me posais réellement la question de savoir est-ce qu'au niveau des États, donc au niveau étatique, est-ce qu'on pouvait euh, exporter ce modèle-là vers d'autres pays du Sahel dans la mesure où, en fait, euh, on sait tous bien que les conflits sont un frein à, au développement, entre autres. Donc, est-ce qu'on pouvait repliquer ce modèle-là au niveau des États-nations et avoir une, une, as we said in English, a very comprehensive and effective policy to deal with those problems throughout the, the, the Sahel. C'est ma question. Je remercie beaucoup. Merci, merci beaucoup. Euh, je ne sais pas si ma, si maintenant euh, la madame, la ministre aim, aimerait bien euh, commenter ou vous continuer à, avec des problèmes de connexion. Mais la question peut être répondue par d'autres experts, je présume. Bon, J'aimerais bien qu'elle puisse commenter un peu la question de, du représentant de Madagascar. Je um, pense que uh, she a des problèmes problems de of, of, of connectivity. Um, I don't have more hands, raised hands. Uh, uh, I would like to receive confirmation from the supporting team. I believe that we do not have more requests for the floor. At this stage, I would like to ask our panelists if they would like to add anything before I move to presenting my uh, my remarks. Madame la Ministre? Oui. Si actuellement on m'entend, peut-être... Oui. Vous avez la parole. Et Madame Christine, ah, oui, nous avons eu de sérieux problèmes pour nous faire entendre ou même pour uh, entendre uh, tout ce qui se disait dans le forum. Et nous avons compris à un moment qu'il y avait une question qui était en rapport avec notre pays. 
et qui concernait le retour à la paix dans les zones d'insécurité dans le Sahel, comme nous l'appelons. Alors, nous avons au niveau du Burkina et, mis en place un programme d'urgence pour le Sahel. Mm -hmm. Il consiste à travailler à faire revenir sur, dans leur zone donc les personnes qui sont déplacées actuellement. Donc ce programme-là a permis de progressivement mettre en place les, les services primaires, santé, éducation et puis autres activités pouvant permettre aux jeunes et puis aux personnes qui le désirent de pouvoir se planté, donc euh, et accorder euh, des crédits pour autonomiser ces personnes-là. Et nous avons dans ces zones des, beaucoup de services qui avaient fermé, les services de, publics de l'administration qui avaient fermé les portes, entre autres même à la justice, euh, le palais de justice de euh, Djibo avait fermé les portes euh, également. Le travail qui est mené par un certain nombre de ministères, le ministère de la Défense, le ministère de la Sécurité, le ministère de la Justice, c'est de faire en sorte que les gens se sentent beaucoup plus sécurisés dans ces zones et de ramener les services qui avaient quitté. À ce jour-là, beaucoup de services ont réintégré, mais il en reste encore et sur lesquels nous sommes en train de travailler. Voilà ce que euh, je pouvais dire. C'est dommage qu'on n'ait on pas pu suivre tout le forum, tout le déroulé, et c'est sûr qu'on aurait pu intervenir à certains moments. Mais bon, les dieux de la technique n'étaient pas de notre côté aujourd'hui. Nous nous en excusons sincèrement parce qu'on euh, était présent sur l'image mais incapable de contribuer donc à, aux échanges. Merci à vous et j'espère que vous nous avez compris. Merci. Indépendant Merci. de notre volonté. Bizarre Merci maintenant, beaucoup. ça va. Merci. Merci, Merci beaucoup, Madame la ministre, euh, pour votre intervention et pour nous donner une idée claire de l'expérience de Burkina dans ce, dans ce sujet-là. Uh, um, now I would like uh, to, to, to give the floor to Dr. Obi, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, I just Dr. Want to Dr. Obi, Mr. Raphael. Dr. Obi, please. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll be very brief. I, I think we, we would also need to look at the question of equal access to education. Uh, a lot of children are out of school and the situation with COVID has made this worse. I think the future of Africa lies to a lot of it, to, to a large extent on access to high quality education, particularly at the primary, secondary and tertiary school levels. We need to, as a matter of urgency, declare a state of emergency in education and begin to address some of these challenges. If we want to be able to transform our resources, if we want to be able to build on the opportunities for innovativeness, for creativity, for mobilizing social energies. Education would need to be addressed. The other thing is, can you really have peace without justice? Let us take another look at access to justice and institutions that deliver justice. How accessible are these to ordinary people? I think this is something we would need to look at. Research and development, tech, new technologies. There has to be a, a way of integrating new technologies into our, our educational sector to produce people who would be able to invent things that will make Africa leapfrog in terms of uh, the technological age. Technologies will help save resources. Technologies would help reduce dependency on global markets because a lot of creation of employment opportunities, a lot of uh, real opportunities to produce goods that can be traded within Africa 
and between Africa in the, and the world and adding value to raw materials before they export it. So education is so important. And I think we need to look at how we can create access to education, access to justice for all. And part of that access to justice will also include issues around transitional justice and reconciliation in conflict affected contexts. Thank you. Dr. Robbie, I can summarize your intervention. Human capital at the center of policy making in Africa. Thank you, Dr. Robbie. Now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Raphael. Please, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Christina. Just to end on a, pos a more positive note uh, is that uh, our challenges are huge and they're, they're, they're many, but obviously they're never beyond our powers to resolve them. So we should also see ourselves as solution providers, not just as people who are experiencing a problem or people who are a problem. We should also see ourselves as a solution. That is one. Two, we must also realize that we are stakeholders in this, all of us. So we need active citizenship wherever we are in our various countries. We need to be involved in addressing some of these, uh, these, uh, these challenges. So that is extremely important. And also the question of leadership. I think we need to ensure that we have responsive, responsible and accountable leadership if we are to address these uh, challenges. And lastly is the question of um, youth exclusion. Uh, in many cases, we always see youth exclusion to be affecting youth, but we must also realize that continued uh, exclusion of youth also denies the society an opportunity to grow because we miss out on important ingredients that come from youth, the energy, the talent, the creativity, that we need to thrive as a society. So we shouldn't just see youth exclusion as a challenge or a problem affecting the youth. We must also realize that by continuing to exclude the youth, we are missing out on what we need to grow and to thrive as a society. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Raphael. Um, you just underscore, uh, I think, an important idea that has been brought by my dear colleague, Huna. COVID-19 is giving us a huge opportunity, a huge opportunity. Because COVID-19 has put on our tables disruptions that in normal times, in routine times, they would not emerge, they would not surface. And we see these disruptions brought by COVID-19, our opportunity, the opportunity for LDCs to grab change towards structural transformation. And I would like to go back again what Dr. Robbie just mentioned. And the only way to grab these opportunities from a policy making standpoint is by putting human capital at the center of policy making. We are today on the 21st century and Africa has a deficit of more than 4 million teachers. So I believe that in order to leapfrog as Dr. Obi well mentioned and my colleague Auna, we do need to embrace technology and innovation. Otherwise, the time will, uh, will chase us uh, in, general, in general terms. So with the, I have no more ends, and I would like to take the opportunity to, uh, to, to start, let's say, the closing of our session, if you allow, if you allow me. So, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, I, would I would like now to provide some, let's say, wrap up ideas, if you allow me to use that expression. Uh, first, I would like to, to tell you that the subject of our today's session is exactly the theme of our flagship product. Also, the office that I lead, I have the pleasure to lead, as a responsibility uh, that has been given by the Secretary General to write 
the report of the Secretary General on the promotion of durable peace and sustainable development in Africa. And the 2021 edition, the subject or the theme of the 2021 edition is exactly what we discuss today. And it's amazing to see, because the report is almost ready, to see how the conclusions of the report are completely aligned of what we discuss here today. Uh, I think that was very clear from the debate and from the, the panelists and from the questions that there is a need to go beyond, as I already mentioned, political legitimacy and build social legitimacy. Because the only way to consolidate political legitimacy as an important source to feed stability, it's by also building social legitimacy. How? Building resilient society. I think this uh, is an idea that came very clear out of our debate. The second one, and was uh, strongly stated uh, on the Honorable Minister from Malawi, as well as Honorable Madame La Ministre from Burkina, it is non-inclusion in service delivery can serve as powerful reinforcement of underlying structural inequalities with the potential to ultimately trigger conflict fomented by long-standing grievance. The third idea, exclusion from vital, and Dr. Obi was very clear on his intervention. So exclusion from vital everyday services, and he mentioned in a very strong way, education. I would add water and sanitation, healthcare, housing, magnifies indeed socioeconomic disparities. Again, I, another important idea from our debate, actual and perceived equality, perception is as important in certain situations as the reality, particularly in a time that social media dominates thinking and action from, from that thinking. So actual and perceived equality, fairness, and non-corruption can only be achieved through meaningful inclusiveness in the process of service deliver at all stages, including, and I think this is important, diverse direct engagement, for example, in planning, budgeting, monitoring, and accountability. So we need to go beyond just providing the service by itself. The process of providing the planning, the budgeting should also be inclusive. And of course, this should be combined with the force to increase transparency in public service delivery. I do believe that the question of transparency in public service delivery will be critical in 2021 addressing vaccine distribution. After being under stress for more than a year, after pushed, after COVID-19 pushed millions of people below the poverty line, to adopt transparency, equality in the vaccine distribution will be a huge source of stability, of stability in Africa. And of course, if you do not address inequalities in Africa, and my colleague Ahuna was very eloquent uh, uh, in these regards. If you do not address inequalities in Africa, we risk sowing seeds for further divisions, frustrations and instability. So we need to further strengthen our capacities in systemizing prevention orientation in planning and delivery. So I would like to finish to tell you that I believe that it's time for all of us, multilateral institutions, international finance institutions, governments, to pay a higher attention to institutions as an intangible asset of the development process. 
E allow me to stress this last idea. Only by building strong institutions, these intangible assets of the development process, I believe we'll be able to move from managing poverty to managing development. These are two different animals. And it is my strong feeling that in the past 20, 30 years, you have been more focused on managing poverty than managing development. And these are two different, these are two different And I, by saying that, I do finish my closing remarks by thanking and expressing my sincere appreciation for your active and insightful discussion. So we have now come to the end of this session. I think you have been champions in terms of managing the time. You have been concise, focused, efficient, and we deliver strong message. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Once again, I would like to thank all the speakers and all the panelists and entities for a such fruitful, fruitful debate. And it's been a pleasure. I wish you the continuation of a great week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The session is adjourned. Thank you.